Good afternoon. Uh, life is full of transitions, changes for everyone. One happens tomorrow when Jamie Smith uh, has her last day with us, and we are going to be extremely sad to see her go. Uh, this is her last briefing with me because I'll be traveling tomorrow, so I wanted to thank Jamie uh, here in the briefing for everything she's done for uh, our operation behind that door and for you uh, here in the press. So thank you, Jamie. <laughs> Another transition, uh, I want to congratulate Brianna Keeler on her promotion. But some things don't change, even as others do. So I'd like to congratulate Ann Compton <laughs> on her Lifetime Achievement Award. Well, that was remarkable. Congratulations. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, really, that's terrific and well-deserved. Uh, I have no other announcements. Uh, I certainly couldn't top those, uh, so I'll go straight to your questions. Josh. Thanks, Jay. Uh, Speaker Boehner, talking about immigration, says that it will be uh, hard to get anything through the House uh, unless the President is able to regain uh, some trust. He's pointing to things such as the liberties that the administration has taken in implementing the health care law. Uh, if you take the Speaker at his word that this is a real obstacle for Republicans, then there, is there anything that the President can do to help restore that trust? Well, I'd say a couple of things. First of all, we remain optimistic about the prospects for comprehensive immigration reform in 2014. We've seen significant movement among Republicans on this issue, and it is heartening to see that Republican leaders in Congress, including the Speaker of the House and others, identify immigration reform as a necessary priority. That's a good thing. When it comes to the President's record on issues encompassed within comprehensive immigration reform, I think it's very important to look at what he's done already in helping build a bipartisan consensus, in uh, uh, helping build the most uh, effective border enforcement that we've ever seen. Uh, over the five years that he's been president, we've seen a significant improvement in our border security. CPB employs over 21,000 Border Patrol agents keeping staffing levels at an all-time high. And they've deployed proven effective surveillance technology tailored to the operational requirements among the, along the highest trafficked areas, making progress toward a, so a safer, stronger, and more secure border. That's, the, that's an issue that I think has been of particular concern uh, to Republicans as well as Democrats. And I think it's reflected in the fact that the legislation in the Senate that the President supports further enhances border security. And when it comes to the President's record on that, I think it speaks for itself. But look, nothing like this, uh, nothing this important, nothing this uh, comprehensive uh, ever uh, comes fast or easy in Washington. So uh, this won't be any different. But it remains an absolute fact that we've made enormous progress in building that consensus and that even uh, the Republican Party, which had as its, as its operative policy position not that long ago on this issue, self-deportation, has come a significant way towards uh, the middle, if you will, or towards the consensus that's now shared by uh, businesses big and small, labor, uh, law enforcement, religious communities, Republicans and Democrats across the country. So uh, we continue to see positive progress. and. You know, we're going to work with Congress uh, to get this done. Uh, in spite of your optimism, the person who's running the chamber that's holding this up says he doesn't see uh, 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 the likelihood of this happening uh, this year. So I'm wondering if there comes a point or will come a point when the president, like he did on climate change and other things, will say, if Congress won't act, I will, and you'll consider what could be done without Congress. There's no alternative to comprehensive immigration reform uh, passing through Congress. It requires legislation. And uh, the President's made that clear in the past, and that continues to be his view. That's why we need to work together to build on the existing bipartisan consensus, uh, to see it help deliver uh, 
a bill through the House and, and then a bill that can ultimately reach the President's desk. Look, I think that the challenges within the Republican Party on this issue are well known and they certainly don't have anything to do with the President. Uh, but as I noted before, the progress has been significant. I think that uh, there is a genuine recognition among leaders in the Republican Party that this is the right thing to do for our economy. It's the right thing to do for our middle class. It's the right thing to do for our businesses. Uh, when we talk about expanding growth and opportunity, comprehensive immigration reform is very much a part of achieving that and achieving it together. So, you know, we're just going to work steadily on this issue, uh, and we believe that it will get done. And on um, raising the debt ceiling, it seems like even some of the extraction, uh, the things that uh, Republicans would like to extract from you in, in exchange for raising the debt ceiling wouldn't be able to win enough support from Republicans who just don't want it raised at all. The Speaker saying he, he probably couldn't even get 218 votes to canonize Mother Teresa. So I'm wondering, <laughs> considering that he's also saying we're not going to default, does this make you more optimistic that we'll be able to raise the debt ceiling without having uh, a prolonged fight that could rattle the markets and create more uncertainty? We certainly believe, Republican leaders who say that we have to raise the debt ceiling, it's the responsibility of Congress to ensure that bills that have already been incurred are paid in a timely fashion so that the United States doesn't default. Our position, the President's position, is what it has been for a long time, which is that we uh, are not going to pay ransom in return for Congress fulfilling this basic responsibility. So this is something that has to be worked out in Congress. Secretary Liu has spoken about the timing on this and the need to move promptly, and we certainly hope and expect that that will happen. Yes, Jeff. Jay, a couple of foreign policy questions uh, for you. Is the United States intervening in Ukraine in any way, arming protesters or otherwise doing anything to help in that conflict? We have been playing uh, a direct role in urging the government to uh, refrain from violence and to sit down and work with the opposition. You know, because it's been read out, that the Vice President has had a number of phone calls with uh, President Yanukovych. And we're committed to working with both the government and the opposition to help de-escalate this crisis so that the Ukrainian people themselves can decide their own future. We condemn violence by any party in Ukraine, uh, and Russian officials should be doing the same. Nonviolence has been the hallmark of the main protest and opposition leaders, uh, and we support that. And we believe that um, part of the discussion has to be an acceptance by the government that uh, peaceful protest needs to be allowed, and that that is uh, a fundamental principle of participatory democracies. So uh, the answer is, you know, the assistance we've provided has been uh, consultation with both sides, urging them to de-escalate the crisis. You mentioned Russian officials. Uh, Kremlin aid essentially accused Washington today of, of intervening, of, of arming the rebels. Are there any, are there any, my question the, the, is. The, the opposition movement has been it has been peaceful, and is a, there are peaceful protests. That is the, the hallmark of this opposition. So I don't know, honestly, what he's talking about. The assistance that uh, we have pro provided has been uh, through conversations that reflect our uh, urging of both sides to de-escalate the crisis, urging the government directly to refrain from violence, urging uh, discussion with the opposition uh, so that a path forward can be uh, decided upon that, that reflects the will of the Ukrainian people. Is the White House aware of a video that's been posted on YouTube um, that apparently is, has a conversation between a State Department official and the U.S. Ambassador uh, talking about a future Ukraine government and using a fairly colorful expletive mm -hmm. uh, about the EU? <laughs> well, I've seen reports about it. I think the State Department uh, obviously is uh, aware of it. Um, you know, we don't discuss private diplomatic conversations. Uh, it's certainly no secret that 
uh, our ambassador and assistant secretary have been working with the government of Ukraine, with the opposition, with business and civil society leaders to support their efforts to find a peaceful solution through dialogue and political and economic reform. Uh, ultimately, it's up to the Ukrainian people to decide their future. Brianna. Do you think the call may be real? Well, I, I would refer you to the State Department. I mean, I think that uh, Assistant T Secretary Newland uh, has been in contact with her EU uh, counterparts and relations with the EU are stronger than ever. And there's no question that we are working. Uh, Assistant Secretary Newland, who has a lot of experience in this area, and our ambassador in Ukraine with the opposition and with uh, the government to try to help de-escalate the crisis. How concerned are you that a phone call like this could be out there? Uh, it's supposed to be private conversation, very candid conversation, it appears, between diplomats. Well, if you're talking about profanity. No, I'm not. Uh, I'm, talk <laughs> I'm talking about, I mean, they're speaking well, look, very, aside from, I'm actually not talking about mm -hmm. the profanity. So you're just talking about? Well, I mean, for instance, uh, Victoria Newland in the call appears to pr prefer one opposition candidate over another saying she doesn't think it's a good idea that a certain Well, I'm not going to comment on the content of you know, private diplomatic conversations. Uh, you know, I would it's, say it's that not private since anymore, the, that's, what's your the video was first noted uh, and tweeted out by the Russian government, I think it says uh, something about uh, Russia's role. But the content of the conversation is not something I'm going to comment on. Russia tapped this phone call? I'm not. I'm just noting that they tweeted it out. <laughs> what, what does it say about their role? Uh, I'm sorry. Refer you to the State Department. Private conversation now does appear to be public. Is mm -hmm. that is that really the stance that uh, a diplomat should be taking? Again, in, I'm not going to discuss one the, candidate over another? I'm not going to discuss the, the conversation, Brianna. What I can tell you is that the Assistant Secretary and our Ambassador and all others have been working with the opposition with the government, with business and civic leaders in Ukraine to help de-escalate the crisis, and uh, because that's in Ukraine's best interests and in the best interests of the Ukrainian people. Anne. Thank you. Uh, back to Speaker Boehner. Would you address specifically his complaint this morning that there's a lack of trust in the president? The speaker said that the president is running around the country telling people he's going to act on his own. He's got a phone and a pen, and he's feeding the distrust because Members of his caucus don't believe the president would actually enforce or respect the rule of law. He's already changed health care, mm -hmm. uh, some of the health care provisions, and they don't believe that the president would enforce security on the border. Well, I, I think, and what I can say on that last point is that the president has an exceptional record of improving border security on his watch. There are more CPB agents on the border now than ever, consistently. and. Uh, you know, that's his record. When it comes to comprehensive immigration reform, it requires legislation. That's why we have worked with members of both parties, uh, why we support bipartisan legislation that passed the Senate with uh, a significant majority, uh, legislation that doesn't reflect word for word the way that the President would have written the bill, but does reflect his principles, uh, very much so, and why we support efforts uh, to move forward on comprehensive immigration reform in the House. I think that, as I said earlier to Josh, this is, you know, these, these, these kinds of issues are, you know, take time, and this has certainly taken some time. There was an effort under the previous President, but Republican President George W. Bush, to pass immigration reform. But you're saying that the Republicans should trust the president, and he's gone as far as he can go on uh, deportations and border security, that the rest has to be legislation. Again, I think that the president's record on border security has been uh, well documented and has been testified to by Democrats and Republicans. Can you trust the president? Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, and I think that, again, the president's record on this issue uh, bears that out. Moreover, when it comes to uh, executive actions versus legislation, we've been saying from the beginning that this is a question of doing both. And immigration reform is uh, something that needs to be done through the legislature, through the Congress. Uh, so, you know, we're going to keep working. Uh, we believe that there's been significant progress. We believe that uh, 
Uh, we note the significant movement that we've seen from Republicans, especially in the House, on this issue. And we acknowledge that this has been historically a difficult issue for the Republican Party. Uh, but we are confident that Republican leaders and uh, a lot of people uh, who Republican officials listen to strongly support immigration reform, and that includes in business and law enforcement, faith communities. Uh, so we're going to get this done. It, it, it's not going to be easy. If it were easy, it would have been done already. Uh, but uh, we're confident that we're making progress, and we're confident that 2014 presents the best opportunity we've ever had to get comprehensive immigration reform uh, passed and signed into law. Cheryl. Thanks. To follow on immigration, um, the CBO report this week, this is totally separate from health care, found that the labor force would be slowing after 2017, in part because of baby boomer retirements. Are you using that or can you use that as an argument for immigration reform? I wanna, can you restate that? I'm not sure I track, but on it. Say it again. The, the labor force is going to be <coughs> slowing mm -hmm. after 2017 because of baby boomer retirements. Right. Is that a good case for immigration well, reform? I, I would say that the economic growth that outside experts have said would come from passing immigration reform is a strong argument for immigration reform. And that economic growth would be spurred by, uh, in a variety of ways, if immigration reform were to pass. Uh, and, and, and that may well be one of them. When it comes to innovation, and ensuring that some of the smartest young people in the world who study in our inter universities are able to stay here and start businesses, that's, that's certainly another way to have immigration reform spur further economic growth and job creation. So uh, this is, as I've said in the past, something that has um, associated with it some pretty strong conservative talking points. Uh, there is, there is a, a strong conservative case to be made for passing comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, and, you know, that's why the President believes that the consensus that's been built around it uh, will ultimately lead to it passing and to him being able to sign it into law. Because going back to some of these other questions, it's not, it's not about him. We are fully confident that House Republicans aren't going to support immigration reform because President Obama believes it's the right thing to do. They're going to do it ultimately because it's the right thing for our economy, it's the right thing for the middle class, it's the right thing for security, uh, and because uh, they're hearing that from a lot of different quarters, uh, from business, from labor, from uh, law enforcement, from religious leaders. So uh, you know, that kind of consensus is uh, not often achieved here. Uh, and uh, I think that reflects why there's such a strong case for getting comprehensive immigration reform done. Jess. And scaling back its drone program in Pakistan? Uh, well, you know I can't talk about uh, operational matters. Uh, what I can say uh, is that the President made clear in his NDU speech that by the end of 2014 in the Afghan war theater, we will no longer have the same need for force protection. And the progress we've made against core al-Qaeda will reduce the need for unmanned strikes. Uh, again, so that's something that the President spoke clearly about in his speech at NDU. Uh, so uh, we've made significant progress against core al-Qaeda. We will also have uh, a, either no troops or a significantly reduced number of troops in Afghanistan after 2014. Uh, and that obviously lessens the force protection needs that we have. So uh, I think those factors play into what the President said about a reduced need for unmanned strikes said last week with al-Qaeda getting better at um, evading U.S. detection. Does that also play into the decision? Well, I, I didn't see that particular uh, point that uh, the ODNI said, but, I mean, or the DNI said. But stepped up its measures to evade U.S. detection, which doesn't seem on its face to be all mm -hmm. that unusual, but does that play into the decision? But I'm not sure, again, since I didn't see that testimony, I'm not sure in the, the, the context if we're talking about core al-Qaeda or uh, other affiliates and, and uh, movements elsewhere in the region. Uh, it's certainly uh, the case that we are um, constantly 
assessing uh, Al Qaeda and core Al Qaeda as well as its affiliates, and uh, we continue the fight against Al Qaeda. But when it comes to core Al Qaeda in the AFPAC regions, there's no question that we've made significant progress against uh, them, and because of that, uh, we will, and because of, as I mentioned, the reduced need for force protection. Uh, the president said we would be able to uh, have a, reduce our need for unmanned strikes. Ed. Jay, uh, one quick one on Ukraine and mm -hmm. another topic. Um, given all the revelations about U.S. surveillance and the back and forth with Germany and others, haven't there been steps taken to make sure that senior U.S. diplomats are speaking on phones that are secure? Ed, I just don't have anything more for you on that. I would refer you to the State Department for more on that, okay. on that issue, that story. Okay. Um, on health care. A lot of stories today, Wall Street Journal, LA Times, about uh, doctor choices being limited for folks uh, and also saying that the federal government is trying to push back and that regulators are taking a look at this, seeing whether insurance companies are going too far with limiting uh, choices on doctors and insurers say they need to do this to keep costs down. Uh, how concerned are you um, that while the website may be getting better, while enrollments are going up, that once folks do enroll, they may have a problem keeping their doctor? Well, there are many ways that the Affordable Care Act helps keep, uh, keep costs down, Ed, and including requiring insurers to spend at least 80 percent of premiums on care instead of overhead, requiring insurance to, uh, insurers to justify rate increases of 10 percent or more, and in providing incentives for providers to deliver smarter care, resulting in better outcomes and lower costs for consumers. Uh, we have put place, we have put protections in place to ensure that consumers have a choice of providers through standards for networks of providers. That's something that's new. Consumer protections in federal and state law require health plans to include a sufficient choice of providers as well as essential community providers. And the ACA allows individuals to appeal their insurance company's decisions about what is or is not covered. Uh, and for 2015, HHS plans to have even more aggressive efforts in place to ensure that consumers have good networks of doctors, community providers, and specialists. Uh, so I think there is a number of protections in place now. Uh, and in 2015, HHS will be uh, launching even more aggressive efforts to ensure that consumers have good networks. The uh, chief of AOL, Tim Armstrong, had to, did some interviews today with various TV networks because their earnings are out. And he claimed that one cost for him right now is it's costing $7 million to implement the president's health care law. And he claims he's going to make a change to 401k benefits to pay for that in part. Are you concerned that some companies may be making decisions like that He's on the record saying that. We don't know how many others may, saying, look, you're, you may get better health benefits, but we're going to have to cut your 401k benefits. Well, I can't speak to any individual company's decisions or the uh, reasons for or rationales expressed for the decisions they make. What has been the case for a long time is that uh, employers have been making changes to health care benefits or eliminating health insurance uh, entirely. That is a trend that has gone on for some time, long predating the ACA. Uh, and that, and there are certainly changes that have been made, uh, as all of you in the private sector know, to uh, other benefit programs, including 401ks, uh, long predating the ACA. What I would say is that every major business in America that provides health insurance to its employees benefits enormously from the historic reduced increase in growth rates that we uh, in cost rates that we've seen in healthcare. That company, any company that was projecting what their health care costs were going to be five years ago, uh, were basing those projections on estimates of health care cost inflation uh, that had turned out to be uh, much higher than reality, resulting in significant savings. Uh, and that is tied uh, in part, in significant part in our view, to the Affordable Care Act becoming a reality. You're not concerned about a shift where they may say, okay, we're going to do a better job with health care, but Look, every, every company, and this has been the case uh, for uh, a lot longer than the ACA has been around, has been making decisions like that. Uh, and what I can tell you is that when it comes to the planning that companies make, the plans that companies make with regards to their health care costs, uh, those decisions are made uh, easier by the fact that Health care costs have been growing at the slowest pace in 50 years since the Affordable Care Act was passed into law. Critics uh, proclaimed with great assurance that the opposite would happen. It turns out they were wrong. You know, uh, they, some of those same critics proclaimed that, you know, the Clinton budget when it passed would lead to recession. 
We saw the longest uh, period of economic growth in our you know, modern history. Sometimes the critics are wrong. Peter. Uh, I want to ask Jay if I can about the terror threat that says that terrorists may be trying to smuggle explosives through toothpaste tubes and other similar containers into Russia right now. The former deputy director of the Central Intelligence, Mike Morrell, said this morning, I'm not overly concerned about this particular threat. Is this administration concerned about this particular threat? And more importantly, should Americans be concerned well, about this threat? What I can tell you is that out of an abundance of caution, DHS routinely shares relevant information with its domestic and international partners, including those associated with international events, such as the Sochi Olympics. And this is an example of that regular communication. DHS has provided more detail, and I refer you to DHS uh, for more detail. Now, as we have said, if we should receive information in the coming days uh, and weeks that changes our assessment of whether people should travel to Sochi, we will make that information public through the State Department's usual channels. Uh, the travel alert that the State Department put out uh, in January, earlier, Jan uh, in earlier, earlier in the year, in January, uh, remains in effect, and it does not advise uh, Americans not to go to Sochi. Sochi, it advises uh, precautions that those uh, who do go to Sochi uh, should take, including registering with the State Department so that they can get uh, quick information should they need it. Uh, with regard to uh, this particular notice that uh, went out, uh, I would note that over the years, certainly since 9-11, uh, there have been many threats to aviation that have resulted in us sharing information with airlines. And our job has always been to provide information to our partners so that collaboratively we can best mitigate the threat. And we're doing uh, so again in this case. So I guess the question then, for a lot of Americans, there were some not mixed messages from you guys, perhaps, but the way this was uh, reported out, there was what appeared to be sort of perhaps not an imminent threat, but real concern. And then this morning there was some reporting that there was not as much concern. So I guess, what is the threshold for you guys to communicate threats of this mm -hmm. sort? Well, I, for that discussion, I think I'd have to refer you to DHS and TSA because they, you know, they evaluate the information and as does our intelligence community and, and, and decide whether uh, it crosses the threshold. There'll be some concern if it's communicated. Well, there's no question. And we have noted that, and that's broadly, speaking, that we have noted there's been an uptick in uh, the uh, threat reporting in the run-up to the Sochi Games, uh, and that is of concern. It is also something that you would expect, and we did expect uh, in this case, in this kind of event. Uh, it's not unusual. But uh, our intelligence community is quite focused on Sochi, and we're not going to be able to comment on each reported threat, we're going to take them all seriously and monitor them. And again, if there's information that the IC receives that changes our assessment about whether or not Americans ought to travel to Sochi, we would certainly make that information available and change uh, our public statements on it to that effect. And you know, I think, because we read it out, that uh, the President convened a meeting earlier this week in the White House Situation Room to receive an update from his team on the U.S. government's efforts to support security for the Olympic Games. So this is something that obviously has the attention of and focus of the intelligence community and other uh, elements of uh, our national security apparatus and obviously the attention of the President. So we're going to keep monitoring it and, uh, and provide uh, information uh, if necessary uh, if it changes our view uh, about the security situation. Following yesterday's meetings at uh, Nats Park with Senate Democrats, I think is one of my colleagues referred to as the field of Dems, which I found to be memorable. Uh, a, a, a Democrat who was there said that the President basically talked a little bit about his standing in some states and, yeah, and, and to that effect. So does the President concede that his appearance in some states where he's unpopular would do more harm than good? The President is going to assist Democrats uh, in every way that he can. But does he do more harm than good in some states? I, I think that the decisions about uh, how different candidates candidate uh, campaign and what you know uh, what they would like in terms of assistance is dis uh, you know is something you can ask those individual candidates about. But he, but he doesn't think that at least he doesn't think there are places. Look, where I he think that the president uh, is just going to do what he can to assist Democrats. I think he has and he will. Uh, and uh, well, I don't think you know the environment this year is qualitatively different than it's been most of the years I've been in Washington when it comes to uh, election cycles. So 
uh, you know, the president is taking an approach that uh, he believes will be uh, of assistance to Democrats uh, because he and the Democrats he supports share the same priorities when it comes to expanding opportunity and you know, taking action that rewards hard work and responsibility. Briefly on a lighter, mo uh, a lighter note, the president was the first ever sitting president to sit on Jay Leno's couch on The Tonight Show after a decades long run at The Tonight Show. He's leaving. Has the president had any conversations with Jay Leno? Is he a fan of Jay Leno? Well, what does he have to say about it? He is a fan and, and he has enjoyed his uh, times on the set uh, with Jay Leno. And, uh, you know, this is the end of an era, I think for a lot of folks uh, who have uh, watched him uh, on The Tonight Show over all these years. So, uh, you know, the president wishes him well. Uh, we all do. And uh, like I said, we've enjoyed, uh, he, I've enjoyed being, being with the president and the times he's been out there. Uh, and I know he's enjoyed the experience. Bill. So will the president stick to his absolutist position on no concessions for the debt limit raise? even if enough members of the Republican caucus can cause trouble and demand something for doing so. Bill, all I would say is our position, the President's position, hasn't changed. It's the same as it was in the fall, and that is that he's not going to pay ransom on behalf of the American people so that Congress does its job. This is a core responsibility that Congress has. You charge charge some things on the credit card, on the nation's credit card, you have an obligation to pay the bill when it comes. And that's all this is. That's what uh, raising the debt ceiling is about. So uh, he expects that um, Congress will fulfill its responsibility. Republican leaders have said again and again that they will uh, do that. They will ensure that the United States <coughs> pays its bills and that the United States doesn't default. Uh, so we're hopeful that that will take place in a timely all fashion. The members are apparently not on board here. Well, I, I, you know, there's been a lot of reporting about that. You guys would know better than I about the different discussions. Uh, I can just say that we're over here making very clear what our position is, what the President's position is, which is that this is something Congress needs to do. And we're hearing that Republican leaders are saying that it's going to get done, and it should get done, because we can't uh, threaten the American economy or the global economy. Uh, in order to try to extract ransom on some uh, some issue or the other, so that's that's been our position, and it's not changing. But even if it comes to that, what well, it comes to what the president's views are clear. The Republican le Republican leaders have said they won't let the country default. Uh, that they understand it's the responsibility of Congress to ensure that uh, our bills are paid. So, you know, that's our position hasn't changed, and we expect Congress to act. He's not going to pay a ransom. Anybody else? Just to follow up yes. on that, do, does the president, how does the president um, interpret the fact that none of the things that the Republicans are talking about, even theoretically attaching to the debt limit, have anything to do with the spending or the deficit or the debt? That's kind of a change from years past when Boehner always insisted on dollar for dollar. Well, I, again, I think there's been a lot of reporting about those discussions, what I, you know, so I, I, I'm not going to characterize that reporting. I'll simply say what our position is, which is, you know, we're not going to pay ransom. The, the American people should not have to, and the president insists they will not pay ransom to uh, Congress or to House Republicans in order for Congress to fulfill its basic responsibility. Uh, that position won't change. Uh, you know, last year we, they shut the government down. Uh, in an effort to do it by shutting the government down and do by trying to hold the economy hostage, which they couldn't do through legislation or through the election or through the Supreme Court when it came to the Affordable Care Act. So I think that ended badly, uh, certainly for the Republican Party, but much more importantly for the economy and the American people. So we're hopeful that that is not a path Republicans want to travel again. Steve, in the back. To something for the debt limit. There was a no budget, no pay provision, basically required the Senate to actually pass a budget resolution, take a lot of difficult votes. Um, I mean, it wasn't necessarily a ransom or, a, you know, you weren't actually paying something. The Senate the Democrats had to do something. Is that kind of procedural kind of sidecar something that could 
resolve the differences here? Again, our, our position is the same as it was last time, the same as it was last fall, no ransom. Uh, you know, what, how, you know, leaders on Capitol Hill uh, figure out the way forward is up to them, uh, but we're not going to pay a ransom in order for Congress to do its job. Leslie, and then Roger. Thanks, Jay. Uh, the President meets later today with the President of Haiti. Uh, one of the concerns, and I'm wondering how concerned the United States is, is that the country hasn't held elections yet. Do you know if that will be addressed? I know that uh, the President looks forward uh, to welcoming uh, President Martelli of Haiti to the White House this afternoon. As you know, the United, United States has uh, stood with Haiti throughout its recovery from the devastating earthquake of 2010. Uh, but our relationship with Haiti is broader and deeper than short-term reconstruction alone. Uh, together with Haiti, we are working to create the conditions for sustainable long-term development, stability, growth, and prosperity. Uh, we are uh, we note that nearly all earthquake rubble has been cleared away. More than 90 percent of Haitians have transitioned out of camps and into housing. HIV AIDS is on the decline. Cholera is down 83 percent from 2011. And the rate of fatality is below 1 percent. Crime is down. GDP growth is on the rise. Reliable access to electricity is up. When it comes to elections, we want to see elections that are free, fair, and transparent, that allow Haitians to express their views as part of the political process, and that provide the political stability that is critical for Haiti's continued progress. We know that building a vibrant democracy is not easy, and it does not take place overnight. The United States has been at it for 237 years, and we continue to work at it every day. But we do see great hope and great potential in Haiti, and we will continue to work closely together uh, to build a brighter, more prosperous future uh, that the Haitian people deserve. Can you expect to read out after the meeting? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I expect uh, some sort of readout. Yes, Roger. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Mr. Boehner is a uh, uh, newser this morning on immigration, uh, talked about his rallying his own troops, but he also added this. He said the president is going to have to provide some votes. Do you have a response to that? On which issue? Sorry. Immigration. Provide, provide some votes? I think that the Democratic Party is strongly in support of immigration reform. I, I'm not sure uh, that I would disagree with Speaker Boehner that uh, he can expect Democratic support for comprehensive immigration reform. Yeah. Follow up, on, follow up on immigration. Um, the, the Speaker last week seemed to put out signals that they really, the leadership at least, wanted to pursue some sort of immigration reform. Mm -hmm. And this today comes out and says some remarks that seem to sort of throw cold water on that, at least that's some of the interpretation. Does the White House see this as a strategy by the Speaker to move this really contentious issue mm -hmm. in a delicate way forward, and that that's an effective strategy so far? Or do you read it as they're not sure what they want to do and this is a bit reactionary, depending on which way the wind's blowing each time? You know, we're just focused on uh, working with Congress uh, to try to move this forward and uh, doing that in a way that reflects the principles the President laid out, reflects the principles embodied in the Senate bill, uh, and reflects the views not just of the President or the Democratic Party, but of this broad and deep consensus across the country. Uh, so we know that this is a difficult issue uh, for the Republican Party, and, and we know the substantial progress that we've seen in terms of views about it among the leadership and the rank and file. So uh, we're going to continue to work with uh, the House uh, and uh, look forward to progress on this issue and ultimately, as I said earlier, to legislation passing that the President can sign. Christy. But, but if that's going to take more than a year and House Republicans make that clear, would the President consider, even as an interim measure, some kind of executive action slowing or stopping deportation? The President has addressed this many times, and I have too. This is, uh, you need a permanent solution to these problems, and that's what comprehensive immigration reform represents. Uh, he has to enforce the law. We operate under prosecutorial discretion and enforcement discretion so that the focus is on uh, criminals. But when it comes to the broader issues that need to be resolved here, 
That has to happen through legislation. That happens, has to happen through comprehensive immigration reform. And the hypotheticals that you lay out, Christy, are not ones that we are here to accept. We believe that uh, there's been significant progress and that this is an opportunity for the consensus that's built out in the country, uh, as well as here in Washington, to push this thing over the finish line. And it won't be easy. Nothing comes easy in Washington, nothing uh, except possibly the naming of a post office. So we, you know, we're not under any illusion that, that this isn't hard work uh, by our friends in the House uh, or by any stakeholder. But it's the right thing to do for the economy, the right thing to do for the middle class, the right thing to do for our security, the right thing to do for our businesses, the right thing to do for innovation. Uh, and ultimately, because of that, we believe this will get done. Yeah, Connie. On the President's trip to Europe and to Saudi Arabia, was any consideration given to go into Israel and to Palestine to try to butt heads together on that issue? Uh, you know, I don't have readouts of our travel discussions. You know the travel that we've announced. Uh, obviously, Secretary Kerry has been very engaged uh, on that issue, and uh, we continue to work hard uh, to help uh, move that Middle East peace process forward. Also this morning, the President made reference to anti-Semitism. Is he going to bring up the issue with the President Hollande because there's growing anti-Semitism in France? Uh, I don't have a preview of his meeting with uh, President Hollande. As the President noted this morning, anti-Semitism is an issue uh, that we are always uh, concerned about and vigilant about. Uh, in terms of this specific conversation, I, I don't have a preview for you. Jim, yeah. I know you addressed this earlier in the brief, but I think I just heard you. Okay. Now more border agents in place than ever before. I didn't. I didn't catch the phrase. Hey. Uh, to be precise, CBP employs over 21,000 border patrol agents, keeping staffing levels at an all-time high. So I read all-time high as all-time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, and they have deployed proven effective surveillance technology tailored to the operational requirements along the highest traffic area. So not only are they putting boots on the ground, but they're using technology to make. Uh, the effort more effective and efficient. The combination of manpower and uh, improvements in technology <coughs> makes our border even more secure. Thanks, Jay. Uh, uh, Justin, Jay? last one. Jay, uh, on Friday, White House Counselor John Podesta told Bloomberg News that the executive order that would prohibit federal contractors from LGBT workplace discrimination was under consideration being looked at by the White House. Um, now, that same day, you called that executive order hypothetical? Is there a reevaluation taking well, place on that? Again, I think that what we said is we don't have any updates for you on that issue. We are pushing Congress to move forward on the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. Uh, you know, we look at and consider a lot of things. Our focus is on getting Congress to pass uh, something that is comprehensive, uh, that represents uh, the President's view that uh, we need to extend equal rights uh, to the LGBT community. And uh, we're working with Congress to, to move that issue forward. So I don't have any updates uh, on that hypothetical EO. I can tell you that we strongly support action by the House uh, in keeping with what the Senate did to get the Employment Non-Discrimination Act passed into law. If you look at the data on this issue, and specifically on the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, I think it is uh, overwhelmingly demonstrated that this has the support of the American people across the country. And as I said again and again, you know, this is a, you know, history's moving on this issue in the right direction. And opposing these kinds of things uh, means finding yourself on the wrong side of history. And I don't think ultimately that uh, any member of Congress wants to be on the wrong side of history. So uh, hopefully we'll see progress. Nobody thought or at least a lot of people didn't think we would see this move through the Senate. It did, uh, and we remain hopeful that it will move through the House. If the strategy is for comprehensive federal legislation, why do an EO for the minimum wage for federal contractors? You know, the, I, I, I take your point, Justin. What I can tell you is that our position on this hasn't changed. Uh, I don't have any update for you on you know, other <coughs> potential or hypothetical EOs. What I can tell you is that we're supporting legislation when it comes to ENDA. Uh, and we continue to press hard for Congress to take action on the minimum wage, uh, because that's the right thing to do. The President has made that clear again and again. So uh, 
again, I, I think it's important to note that uh, you know, Americans' views on these issues uh, have become increasingly clear. And uh, to oppose legislation that enshrines equal rights uh, is, is to oppose the tide of history. And we certainly hope that, in the end, uh, members of Congress, members of the House, uh, don't want to be on the wrong side of that. Thank you all very much.